Turn with me, please, to the book of Numbers, chapter 5. In the Hebrew canon, the book of Numbers is called Be'midbar, Be'midbar, in the wilderness. Numbers, chapter 5. We're looking at the right of ordeal and the law of jealousy. The right of ordeal and the law of jealousy from Numbers 5, commencing in verse 11, please. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, and a man has intercourse with her and it's hidden from the eyes of her husband, and she's undetected, although she has defiled herself, and there's no witness against her, and she has not been caught in the act. If a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he's jealous of his wife when she has defiled herself, or if a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he's jealous of his wife when she has not defiled herself, the man shall bring his wife to the priest and shall bring as an offering for her one-tenth of an ephah, a barley meal. He shall not pour oil on it nor put frankincense on it. It's a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering of memorial, a reminder of iniquity. Then the priest shall bring her near and have her stand before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthenware vessel, and he shall take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. The priest shall then have the woman stand before the Lord and let the hair of the woman's head go loose and place the grain offering of memorial in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy, and in the hand of the priest is to be the water of bitterness that brings a curse. And the priest shall have her take an oath and say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray into uncleanness, having been under the, under the authority of your husband, be immune to the water of bitterness that brings a curse. If you, however, have gone astray, being under the authority of your husband, and you have defiled yourself, and a man other than your husband has had intercourse with you, the priest shall then have the woman swear with the oath of the curse, and the priest shall say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among the people. By the Lord's making, your thigh waste away and your abdomen swell. Now, I'll just translate this from the Hebrew, this one verse. The term is hapalot, hapalot. It is an ancient metaphor for your thigh will waste away and your abdomen swell. It means to miscarry. It means to miscarry or to auto-abort, to, to abort or to miscarry, okay? And this water that brings a curse shall go into your stomach and make your abdomen swell and your thigh waste away. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. The priest shall then write these curses on a scroll and shall wash them off into the water of bitterness. Then he shall make the woman drink the water of bitterness that brings a curse, so that the water which brings the curse will go into her and cause bitterness. And the priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand and wave the grain offering before the Lord and bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of grain offering as its memorial offering and offer it up in smoke on the altar, and afterwards he shall make the woman drink the water. When he has made her drink the water, then it shall come about that if she has defiled herself and been unfaithful to her husband, that the water which brings the curse shall go into her and cause bitterness. Her abdomen will swell, her thigh will waste away, and the woman will become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, she will then be free and conceive children. This is the law of jealousy when a wife being under the authority of her husband goes astray and defiles herself. Or when a spirit of jealousy comes over a man and he's jealous of his wife, he shall then make the woman stand before the Lord and the priest shall apply all this law to her. Moreover, the man shall be free from guilt 
but the woman shall bear her guilt. An ancient Near Eastern fertility rites. An ancient Near Eastern fertility rites. But what does it mean for us as believers? Once again, as Karl Barth said, novum testamentum in vetere latet. The new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. We can only understand these things in light of the New Testament revelation of Jesus, the Messiah. The right of ordeal and the law of jealousy. I've explained many times in various of our recorded teachings that in both testaments, idolatry is referred to as adultery. Idolatry is referred to as adultery. We see this most conspicuously, though not only, certainly in the book of Hosea. When Israel went after other gods, O daughter of Zion, you played the harlot, this kind of thing. Okay. So too in the New Testament. The epistle of James was probably the first book of the New Testament written. It was written to Jewish believers. And in it, he calls worldly churches adulteresses. Now this would have shocked Jews. You're telling us as believers in Jesus, as saved believers in Jesus, we're doing the same thing our forefathers did when they worshiped Baal? You adulterers. Znut in Hebrew, idolatry is called adultery. God does not want anybody messing with his woman. Okay? God does not want anyone messing with his woman. You don't want somebody fooling around with your old lady? It's because God doesn't want anybody messing with his. We are imagio dei beings made in his image and likeness. I've explained this many times, but for the sake of the recording, I'll go through it quick. As imagio dei beings, we have a body, a soul, and a spirit, as we said, because God does. He has a body, Jesus. Even in the Old Testament, Christ manifested physically. When Adam heard God walking in the garden, that was Jesus. The Father and the Spirit never appear in human form. We have a spirit because God does. And we have a soul, a mind, because God does, who has known the mind of the Father. We are not apes with better DNA, as secular psychology and Darwinism teaches. We are three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. Okay. Now, in holy matrimony, niknas ba is the Hebrew idiom usually for marriage, like with Ruth, and he went into her, and the Lord allowed her to conceive. Niknas ba, you go into her. One person goes inside of another, and a third is procreated. It's three in one, it's one in three. That reflects the Trinity, you understand? The fact that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit reflects the Trinity. We're made in his image and likeness. It reflects the triunity of the Creator. So does holy matrimony and marital procreation, okay? Now, I've explained this before many times. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, a figure of Christ, he had to undergo a ritual called Mekudesh, Mekudesh. You get the word Kodesh, holy, being set apart by God. Only the person set apart by God could go into the Holy of Holies. Everybody could know what was in the Holy of Holies, but only the person set apart by God was to know what it was like to go in. A Greek term would be gnosko, to know intimately, gnosko. Despite what other people will tell you in the Greek, it said Joseph did not gnosko, marry, know her intimately, sexually, until Jesus was born. Okay. If, Mary and Jesus, if Mary and Joseph had an unconsummated marriage, Jesus' parents would not have been legally married by Jewish law. <laughs> Roman Catholicism dishonors Mary and Joseph. Nonetheless, let's understand this. Ah, only the person who's made Kudesh can go in. Marriage is the same. The same name for the ritual the high priest had to go through before he could go in is the same Hebrew term for to marry somebody under the banner. We touched on this yesterday, didn't we? No? Make Kudesh. In Hebrew, when you get married, you say, 
Ani me kudeshet lach im a tabat zug ki dat Moshe ve Israel. With this ring, I wed thee according to the laws of Moses and Israel. Then you step on a wine glass. That's the last time you ever put your foot down. But anyway. <laughs> You've had it. You've had it, brother. <laughs> now you can go in. You understand? Any Hebrew could read the Torah and read about the showbread, and they could read about the Decalogue. They could know what was in the Holy of Holies, but they were not to experientially know what it was like to go into the Holy of Holies. Anybody can get a cup, a textbook of, of Gray's Clinical Anatomy. You can look at ovarian tissue and fallopian tubes all you want. Anybody can know what's in there, but only the person who is Mekudesh, set apart by God, is to know what it's like to go in there, experientially. You understand? If anyone else other than the high priest went in to the Holy of Holies, to the Kodesh Kodeshim, it was an abomination. If anybody other than the husband goes into the bride, it's an abomination. Your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, you're defiling it. You understand? Same term. Well, it's the same thing. Adam and Eve were to know sin existed. They were put in the garden and told us to do it. But they were not to know it experientially. They were to know what it was objectively, but not subjectively. <laughs> There's to know and there's to know, okay? <laughs> you can know what a bank robbery is, but you're not, you're not supposed to know what it's like to pull a bank job. <laughs> this is Morgan Stanley, we'll get you a dispensation. You can <laughs> stick them up if you want. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> this is the way it is. It's gotta be the person set apart. There was a barrier called the Mechitzat, or Mechitzot. The final barrier was the way into the Holy of Holies. If you went beyond that barrier, it was an abomination, unless you were the high priest, the proper person at the proper time. It's the same thing with the human female, okay? Not to be gross, but the hymen membrane is like the Mechitzat. <laughs> Only one person is supposed to know what it's like to go beyond that point, okay? intimately, in terms of marital intimacy. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. The whole marital relationship reflects the triunity of the Godhead, God's relationship with Israel, and Christ's relationship with the church. You understand? Sing and rejoice of daughter of Zion, for I come. I will dwell in the midst of thee. Jesus wants to be inside his bride. Okay? Marital intimacy reflects this. This is much of the poetic metaphor and the Song of Solomon is about this. Come into my garden, my system, my bride, and all this kind of stuff, going into the garden and planting seeds. It's using poetic metaphor, obviously, for marital romance, reproduction, and things like that. Okay? So idolatry is called adultery. When Israel fooled around with other gods, the husband here becomes jealous. We have to understand something. Honor thy father and mother. Again, in Greek, the word honor, honorarium. In Hebrew, it's something different. It's the word kavod. Kavod is the word for honor. But it comes from the word kaved, meaning heavy, heavy. It's also the term for liver, the heaviest organ of the human organism. Kaved, to be heavy. In other words, as your parents were financially responsible for you or for us in our pediatric years, should the need arise, we are responsible for them in their geriatric years. And the New Testament, the New Testament says this is a commandment with a promise. If you don't take care of your parents in old age, don't expect much longevity yourself. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's even in the New Testament. That's what it means. It's like the third world today. Very high infant mortality. Why will people in Africa or areas of Asia or Latin America have 10, even 12 kids, knowing that half of them are gonna be dead before the age of five in some places? Well, for the sake of the five that are, that are gonna make it. 
That's your pension. No social security, no pension, no superannuation funds. Your kids, is, that's it. Not having children had tremendous consequences in ancient Israel. For the provision of the widow, that was a big thing. It was so important that if a guy died without leaving a son to take care of his widow, his brother would be expected to procreate a brother, a son on her behalf, and for all legal purposes, the son would be the son of the deceased brother. This is in the book of Ruth and the book of Deuteronomy, it's redeeming the name. It's called Leverite marriage. It is one of the ways, one of the ways, that we account for the apparent discrepancies between Luke's genealogy and that of Matthew. You understand? The apparent discrepancies between the genealogies are partially accounted for by Leverite marriage. Partially Leverite marriage. You have a, you procreate a son on behalf of your brother, take care of it. It was the only place and the only time when birth control was forbidden. Obviously, the only form of birth control they had in the ancient world was coitus interruptus. You couldn't do that if you were in a Leverite marriage situation. In other words, you could not use your brother's widow as a sex object. <laughs> He couldn't use your brother's widow just as a sex, for sexual entertainment. It had to be that you're looking to procreate a son. The other factor was Yerusha, the inheritance. The family land and the apportionment of Joshua, tribally and, and by family, had to always revert in the year of Jubilee. You had to keep the right genealogy for the Yerusha. This became very important, especially in the tribes of Levi, to know who the high priest would be, and the tribe of Judah, to know who ult the kings and ultimately the, the right Messiah would be. You understand? This Yerusha thing was really, really important. So not having a child was considered a curse from God. <laughs> it was considered a curse from God. You had to have somebody else redeem the name, procreate a brother on behalf of a dead widow. It's just uh, on behalf of a widow, it was, it was a dead husband, just the way it was. It was seen as a curse from God. There were certain maladies that were seen as divine judgments. In the ancient world, literacy, in the pagan world, was the reserve of nobility, royalty, military commanders, and pagan priesthoods, not with the Jews. With the Hebrews, the Levites had to make sure every Jew could read the Word of God. The Jews were a fully literate society. To this day, in any society, practically, certainly in the Western world where you find Jews, you'll find a disproportionately high, high amount of Jews with higher education, <laughs> even to the postgraduate level. To this day, education is emphasized. This goes back to the Torah. Even in the ancient world, every Jew had to be literate. When it says the apostles were uneducated men, they would have been quite educated by Greco-Roman standards. <laughs> they just were not that well educated by Hebraic standards. Everybody understand? So if, it, if you were born blind, you couldn't read the Torah, you would be disincluded from the community of worship. Hence, in John chapter 9, when the kid was born blind, they asked Jesus who sinned, him or his parents? <laughs> This is seen as a curse. He can't read the Torah. He can't worship in the temple. Well, infertility was the same thing. It was seen as a curse. You remember in the matriarchal narratives, give me children or I die? The, the, the cries of racial and all of that stuff? It was a big deal. Now, of course, every supernatural conception you see in the Old Testament they're usually geriatric conceptions, postmenopausal conceptions, and things like Sarah and things like that. And the, the, the parents of Samson and, and, and Samuel and all that. They're all types of Christ, aren't they? That it would be by divine intervention the conception would take place. It's an Old Testament foreshadowing of the fact that Jesus would be conceived supernaturally, just like John the Baptist. They're all types of the Messiah. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Okay. So this infertility was a big deal. They didn't have infertility clinics today where they do sperm counts and all that kind of stuff. They didn't have reproductive endocrinologists in those days. They had the right of ordeal and the law of jealousy. What is wrong? How come every time, every time you become pregnant, you miscarry? How come you never carry full term? 
this would arouse suspicion, jealousy. Is it because of infidelity? Have you been sleeping around? That's how they would have thought of it. What is the reason that you can never carry full term? What is the reason you always miscarry? This would have aroused suspicion and jealousy in the husband, okay, in the ancient Near East. <coughs> so God ordains a fertility ritual. And in this fertility ritual, you have the grain, the word of God, okay. Different grains, like wheat, barley, and so forth, they're figurative of the word of God from different aspects, okay. Barley has to do with judgment, usually, remember? Like in the song, uh, uh, in the, uh, with Gideon, they made the barley loaves. <laughs> well, then there was, the wheat is different, but it's all the word of God. All these grains are figures of the word of God from different aspects. Then they had to take the curses of the Torah, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, write them, <laughs> write them down on a parchment and rinse the parchment into water. Put the word into the water with the curses and drink it. If she miscarried again, it would have been an indictment. It would have been proof of infidelity. But if she was innocent, she would have conceived and carried full term. Everybody understand? That's the background. Let's begin looking now at Numbers 5. The adultery test, the right of ordeal, the law of jealousy. If a husband is away on business trips or ministry trips, and he has sufficient reason to believe his wife is engaging in infidelity, extramarital immorality, he's not interested in a second honeymoon. He's not interested in taking her to Maui for a second honeymoon. He's not interested in a romantic candlelight dinner. He's interested in finding out if his wife is engaged in infidelity. Before this ritual could take place, he would bring her before the priest. It begins with the word, the barley, but there'd be no frankincense. There'd be no incense. He shall not pour incense on it. It's a grain offering. Remember, incense is the prayer of the saints. Revelation, Ezekiel, is worship. One of the things you see in an unfaithful church is the worship of worship. What used to be the Christian music ministry has now become the Christian music industry, based in Memphis, Tennessee, and in Sydney, Australia, with Hillsong. It's a racket. It's a business. Many Christian recording companies are owned by secular conglomerates. The same is true of the Christian publishing industry. What had been Christian ministry is now a Christian industry. Only it's not Christian. They're just putting the Lord's name on it. Remember, as once was said by a preacher from Northern Ireland, there's no doxology without theology. In other words, if the lyrics are not scriptural, God does not accept the worship. God does not accept the worship. Jesus said the Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. If the lyrics are wrong, it's not truth and it's not the right spirit. I'll give you an example. A big problem today, I'll give you two examples, two big problems today. First of all is pneumocentric worship. Our faith is Christocentric. The Holy Spirit is worshipped as God within the context of the Trinity. He was playing holy, holy, holy God in three persons, perfectly biblical. If God ever made a better hymn writer, better hymn composer than Charles Wesley, I'd love to hear him. Holy, holy, holy God in three persons. Blessed Trinity, perfectly scriptural. But come Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Good morning, Holy Spirit. None of that is biblical. It opens the door for a counterfeit spirit. The Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus, never himself. Our faith is Christocentric, not pneumocentric. The Holy Spirit is God and worshiped as God within the context of the Trinity only. Another example. Re 
repetitive. Seven eleven choruses, as David Hockney once called them. The same seven words eleven times. <laughs> Jesus said, don't do that. Don't repeat these phrases like the heathen do. In Hinduism, it is known as a mantra. It has a mesmerizing effect. The Greek word is mesmero. It's found in Galatians. It means to put the evil eye on people. You manipulate people psychologically as a form of spiritual seduction. They sing the same thing over and over and over again, and it predisposes them to manipulation. So when some money preacher swings his jacket and blows on them, they all fall down but they're predisposed to it by this mesmerizing effect, you understand? Same things happen in Hinduism. Basically what you see today with this kind of phenomena is a combination of hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception. It's a combination of hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception. The real biblical phenomena of being slain in the spirit doesn't work that way. They always fell forward not backward. The only time they went backward is when they came to arrest Jesus, and that was a judgment. <laughs> this whole thing today, they're not burning incense, they're burning strange fire. You understand? And it's become a business. Now, get rid of the incense. The Lord is not interested in worship where there's sin. First deal with the sin. Then burn the incense. He wants to know if there's infidelity. Does my bride have other lovers? Well, the bride has other lovers today. The worship of worship is only one of the idols. Another is mammon. The worship of mammon, pioneered by the teller evangelists. The love of money, not money! The love of money. That's an idolatry. You've got money preachers on TV teaching the sin of covetousness and calling it faith. They are not teaching faith in Jesus. They are teaching faith in faith. The worship of worship and faith in faith. Not faith in Jesus, not the worship of the Lord. They actually call the sin of covetousness faith. This is idolatry. It is the worship of mammon. The worship of mammon. Now, I've known many affluent Christians, some of them quite godly. And they understand that God gave them their money to finance his work. Don't forget there is a biblical gift of philanthropy in Romans 12. Let he who gives, gives give with liberality. There are people who have the gift of philanthropy. God shows them how to make a lot of money to finance his work. Well, let me tell you about these people. There's three characteristics I always see in people who have this gift, if they really have it. One, they all went through a hard time in their life when they were broke or went to the wall financially. Even if they were born wealthy, something happened to them where they couldn't trust their money. They had to learn to trust the Lord. They all <laughs> underwent serious trials where their money did them no good or they lost their money. Second, before God could begin to really use them. They had to learn to trust him and not wealth. You know, when you don't have anything, you've got to trust the Lord. You got a couple of platinum credit cards in your wallet, it's easy. <laughs> second, second characteristic of these people. They are not arrogant. They're not arrogant. Many of them, unless, most of them, unless you knew them personally, you wouldn't know they were loaded. Third, if they lost their money tomorrow, they would not lose their faith. <laughs> If they lost their money tomorrow, they'd not lose their faith. Now, if you don't see those three features, they don't have the gift of philanthropy. <laughs> it's not money, it's the love of money. Mammon worship. Okay. Mammon worship. John Wesley was right, the founder of the Methodists. Make all you can so you can give all you can. He was right. He was right. 
Ah, the pharaohs wanted to take it with them, so they built the pyramids and they put treasures in the pyramids. That's not how you take it with you. You want to take it with you? <laughs> Be generous unto the Lord and his work, then you take it with you. <laughs> That's the only way to take it with you. Otherwise, as it says in Ecclesiastes, it's going to stay here and God knows who's going to get it. <laughs> the lawyers will fight over it. Well, let's continue with this. Mammon is another big idol today. Christianity, biblical Christianity, is in decline in the developed world. You understand? It's in decline. By any barometer of church history, Protestantism is a dying religion in the developed world. It is dying a self-inflicted death. It is dying theologically, dying spiritually, dying morally, and dying numerically. These denominations are caving in. The real growth is in small groups and house churches. Most of what's artificially called growth today is transfer growth following the new apostolic reformation garbage, the Peter Wagner garbage of people leading one church for another. They're competing with each other instead of competing with the world. <laughs> They're thinking like secular management, taking clients away from each other instead of pilfering Satan's kingdom. It's transfer growth. And they're calling that blessing and growth when it is not. Now, in the third world, it's different. Third world, there is numerical growth, but they have a lot of other problems. I only mention these things briefly. Let's continue. So, where's the babies? Where's the growth? There hasn't been a revival in the United States since the Jesus movement among the hippies. The only place in Europe where there's a revival in Western Europe now is among gypsies. There are moves of God in the Catholic countries in Europe. The churches are growing slowly and steadily in Ireland. People coming out of Catholicism. They're growing steadily in places like Italy, Spain, and Portugal. Not hugely, but steadily and, and conspicuously. Eastern Europe, the Eastern Orthodox countries, Albania, Romania, there's a lot of growth. But these are countries that never had the Reformation. England, Scotland, Wales, Holland, Germany, Switzerland, the Protestant countries that had the Reformation. In Germany, you've got 2% weekly church attendance. That's Catholic and Protestant together. In Britain, it's less than 10%. And America is declining. Although the figures do lie because more people are meeting in homes. So you, although visible church attendance is declining, overall church attendance is not declining as much as they're saying, it's just that denominational Christianity is declining or uh, killing itself off. Well, let's look at this. Where's the babies? Where's the infant? You know, there's always a miscarriage. They're always saying there's some kind of a revival, but it doesn't happen. There are actually two articles written in the American Journal of Psychiatric Medicine two that I know of, and one in The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, on hysterical pregnancy syndrome. There are women who are so desperate to have a baby going to the, going to the fertility clinics that they psychologically convince themselves that they are pregnant when they're not. There have even been clinically documented cases where menstrual cycles have been interrupted psychosomatically up to a limited point. And these women convince themselves that they're pregnant. Well, this is what's happened in the Bride of Christ in the Western world. One counterfeit revival after another. They go to Toronto. They go to Pensacola. They go to Lakeland. They're always having a revival. But no revival comes, there's always a miscarriage. Forgive me, my crutches are over there, but it's something like this. We're going to Toronto, we're having a revival. We're going to Pensacola, we're having a revival. We're going to hear Beth Moore, we're having a revival. We're going to see the tattooed goon. We're having a revival. Lady, 
You can stuff all the cushions under your frock you want to. But there ain't no bun in the oven. <laughs> And the husband wants to know why. We're going to settle this thing. Get over here, toots. <laughs> Stand before the Lord. Put the grain in your hand. You see these curses of the law? I'm going to write them down. After I write them all down, We're going to put them into this water. This water will either indict or cleanse. Look with me, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. If it's your life or hers on the line, so long, Charlie, we'll see you in heaven. If you're not willing to die to save the life of your wife, you don't love her. You understand that? Same as the pastor, willing to die for, unto the Lord for the sake of his sheep. A husband has to lay his life, if it's your life or hers. You'll see her in heaven. Now it's a lot easier for a woman to be in submission to a man who she knows would die for her. Verse 26, that he might sanctify her, make Kudesh set her apart, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now, before you drink it, take your hair down. I'm not interested in how pretty you are, or the kofia, or the hairstyle. It says she shall make her take her hair down. You know the colloquialism, to let one's hair down? To show somebody where you're really at, what you really like? You ever notice how these televangelists and their wives, they all look like Barbie dolls with these outrageous things? Some of them look some of them, some of them look some of them look like whores. <laughs> they look some of them look like the whore of Babylon. I remember it. Remember adorn yourself modestly. I'm not against makeup, you <laughs> know. You know, when Peter said not with braided hair and the makeup, that in the Greek culture, that was the uniform of a prostitute. In the Song of Solomon, you don't see it. There is makeup in cosmetics. It, the culture determined if it was right or wrong. In our culture, lipstick and the earring, that's not the uniform of a prostitute. But the way, but, but if you look at a hooker on 8th Avenue in New York, they look like, they look like the wife of a televangelist. <laughs> There's a reason, there's a spiritual reason that, 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 that Crouch's wife and Baker's wife, there's a reason they look like the whore of Babylon. There's a reason they even look like the whore of Babylon. And the other, every time they called the husband a crook, which he wasn't, he got caught and he went to prison for it, she began crying and the mascara would go down her face, she looked like the Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> the world, the world would mock this. The world... It, it was good for nothing except discrediting the gospel. If I, by the grace of Jesus, was not already saved, and I thought that that was being born again, I wouldn't get born again. Among other problems, completely bulldozes the witness and testimony of the church. Take your hair down. One of the main things that happens in the last days, Isaiah 28, woe to the crown of the proud drunkards of Ephraim, the self-glorification of the church, the Jezebel spirit. Her husband Ahab was her meal ticket. She was out for herself. Just read Revelation 17 and 18. The husband just becomes an agent or a vehicle for self-glorification. A faithful bride 
seeks the honor of her husband. He, in turn, honors her. A faithful bride seeks the honor of her husband. He, in turn, honors her. An unfaithful bride, like in Revelation 17, 18, the harlot and all of that are in the character of Jezebel. She simply uses the husband as a vehicle. She's into self-glorification. That is a big problem. In the last days, people are not building the kingdom of God. They're building their own empires and putting God's name on it in many cases. If God says, get a building, get a building. If he says, get a thousand buildings, get a thousand buildings. By all means, if God says it. But you see these mega building projects, and these mega a lot of these guys are simply building monuments to themselves. Thank God that Crystal Cathedral is gone. Thank God the first mega, thank God it's gone. That Schuler stood up when the Pope, the pedophile protecting Pope came to Los Angeles and said we should ask the Holy Father the way home. No problem, he is home. Give him the keys. The Archdiocese of San Diego bought the place for a song and a dance after Schuler went to the wall bankrupt. 56 million in the hole. <laughs> it, the Holy Father is home. Just give him the keys. Get out. Take your hair down. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. 19, oh, 1 Corinthians 11, please. Verse 15. If a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Take your hair down. We don't want to know how pretty you are. We want to know where you're really at, what you're really doing. This is an infertility clinic. Infertility clinic. This is uh, reproductive endocrinology. The prettiest woman in the world isn't so attractive in an infertility clinic. They're taking ovarian tissue slides and they're doing all kinds of biopsies and things like this. It's a rather unpleasant mess. It's uncomfortable procedures and it involves blood and it involves urine. I don't care how good looking she is. She's not in the infertility clinic to look pretty. She's in the infertility clinic to find out why she can't have a baby. It may be sexual, but it's not sexy. <laughs> Take your hair down. We're going to find out where you're really at. <coughs> Put this grain in your hand and drink this. These curses. Now, if you're innocent, it's going to cause you to carry full term. You are immune from the curses, it says. You're immune. But if you're guilty, you're going to miscarry. And it's going to prove your guilt. And she shall say, Amen, Amen. Only an innocent bride will say, Amen, Amen, and drink the water. An innocent bride has everything to gain and nothing to fear. An innocent bride has everything to gain and nothing to lose. She will say, amen, amen. Give me the grain. Let me drink it. But a guilty one? Why do you think these churches don't expound the word of God anymore? Why do you think these guys stand up and tell anecdotes and stories all the time instead of, or they take a text out of context and one scripture and they, they, they tell stories? Why don't they exegete the word of God? Why don't these guys study? You know what? Why are the seminaries emphasizing programmatics and marketing instead of teaching people to to read Greek and Hebrew and understand the original. <laughs> why, why are they doing this? The guilty bride doesn't want that barley. She's not going to drink that water. 
Even churches that were once strong in the word, conservative Baptists are no longer that conservative. The Grace Brethren, <laughs> those guys lost the plot 15, 20 years ago. They began losing the plot 15, 20 years ago. The old time Grace Brethren wouldn't recognize these guys. The old time guys, 30, 40, they wouldn't recognize these guys. John Wesley wouldn't recognize the Methodists. They'd probably throw them out. They'd probably throw them out. The Pentecostalism had problems even from Azusa Street. But some people came along and put grain into the toxic stew. The old time Pentecostals were biblically grounded and they had emphasized holiness and moral living, things like that, and evangelism. All of this hype and these money preachers and all this Branham stuff and the the old-time Pentecostals rejected people like Kenyon and Branham. Like, and, and now the Kansas City prophets, they, they embrace it. They embrace the very things the older generation of Pentecostals would have nothing to do with. Guilty bride. I've been sleeping around. As I once said in an Afro-American church here in Ohio, you mama, she been missing. Your wife has been unfaithful. But it says, if he is jealous, God is a jealous God. He's jealous for Israel. He's still jealous for Israel and the Jews. And Jesus is jealous for his bride, the church. He doesn't want anybody sexually fooling around with his old lady. You're away on a business trip or a ministry trip. You don't want anybody stepping into the bedroom, filling in for you when you're away. Why are we like that? Because we're a magio dei. We're made in his image and likeness. He's like that. The reason we don't want anybody fooling around with our wives or our husbands is God doesn't want anybody fooling around with his. But it has consequences. The consequences are hapalot. Now, hapalot in Hebrew, the word for miscarriage, is also the word for abortion. Same word. One is induced, one is non induced. Same word in Hebrew. This abortion industry, people actually using abortion as a form of birth control, they're actually, use, they're actually killing babies as a form of birth control. That was the worship of Molech. This is worship of other gods. Moses and Paul called other gods demons. Shadim, Damanoi. Sacrificing babies. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. That one guy who ran the abortion mill who got assassinated, he was shot dead in his church, remember? <laughs> he was very religious. That he was a Christian. It's unbelievable. No, there's a reason that we're calling growth growth when it's only transfer growth. You can't make a revival happen. There are only principles that begins with prayer and repentance. But even without a major outpouring of God's Spirit, you're still going to have some growth. <laughs> you may not have 10 kids, but you'll have two. Where is it? Where are people really being saved and discipled? It happens, but not much. There's a reason. There's infidelity. It's a judgment. It's infertility. It's an incapacity to conceive or to carry full term. And the bridegroom is jealous. And he wants to know why. Take your hair down. Get rid of the incense. Let's put the worship to one side for a moment. Let's put the self-glorification of the church aside for one moment. 
Don't worry about the coffee and the hairstyle. Don't worry about the new clothes from Lord and Taylor. Take your hair down and put this in your hand. Put the curses into the water and drink it. The guilty bride will be disclosed. She will be publicly indicted. The guilty bride has everything to lose. The faithful bride has everything to gain. God bless and thank you.